Amen. So keep your place there in Luke chapter 12. The verse that we're going to focus on, you're going to keep your place there. We're going to come back to it a couple times throughout the sermon. But the verse I want to focus on is verse number 51 where Jesus says, um, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. So in verse number 51, we see a great verse from Jesus there, a verse that's uh, um, pretty much ignored today. Um, I told you on Wednesday night that I would preach a sermon on the universal church, um, so here it is. I'm going to preach a sermon on the universal church and this doctrine of the universal church. Um, this is kind of a personal doctrine to me because I grew up with the belief, you know, growing up in the Lutheran church, which is basically um, very Catholic, the same. Um, I grew up with this doctrine of the universal church, and after um, getting saved and then getting into a Baptist church, I noticed right away that, you know, the Baptist preaching and the biblical preaching that I was listening to, even before I got into a Baptist church, was very focused on um, the local New Testament church. You know, that phrase is used over and over and over again. And I guess at the beginning of my Christian walk and my Christian life, I guess you could say, I didn't really understand the full scope of how, um, you know, serious this doctrine is. Um, for me... Um, the, the doctrine of the universal church was mainly um, realized in the Nicene Creed. If you've ever heard um, that, the Nicene Creed was a creed that you would chant. It was a vain repetition that you would chant um, in every church service or every, every mass that you would go to. You would just chant this belief. And it's commonly held, by the way, if you go and you just Google what people think about the Nicene Creed, um, it's commonly held that this, this creed encompasses you know, Christian um, beliefs, you know, four or five points of Christian belief. Now, you know, that's what people looking at Christianity from the outside um, think, all right? And in the Nicene Creed, of course, it says, I believe in one, part of it is I believe in one, holy, um, Catholic is, is one version, Catholic meaning universal, Catholic and apostolic church. It's kind of one of those, you're just chanting these beliefs. Um, they do have the Trinity in there, so there are some things that are correct, which makes it even more confusing to people. But basically, the Nicene Creed was created, if you just look at the, the birth of, of Christianity, let me give you a history of Christianity in, in two and a half minutes, all right? So basically, you look at what we're looking at in the book of Acts um, on Wednesday night. You have the book of Acts where maybe you, we go up to 60 or 70 um, AD, where the church, the churches, I'm sorry, the churches are being persecuted largely by the Jews in the book of Acts. But that transitioned um, during Nero's reign into persecution by the Roman government itself. And then, of course, I've talked about this in um, many sermons. Uh, the, the Martyr's Mirror and other secular historical documents talk about the ten Roman persecutions, which is basically, it was you know, nearly 300 years, 250 years of persecution by um, different Roman emperors, different Roman rulers, all right? It was, you know, a terrible time for Christianity. Um, terrible things were done. But then in uh, 300, 313, I believe it was, or three, 313, I believe, was the Edict of Milan, where basically Constant, uh, Constantine, this Roman emperor, kind of declared the persecutions over, let's leave the Christians alone kind of thing. And then in 325 AD, something that is touted by the Catholic Church and even Lutheran churches, was this Council of Nicaea that was, that was brought together. And this is kind of the formation of what we know as the Roman Catholic Church, the Council of Nicaea. Now, many people, and if you, you look this up, many people call the Council of Nicaea. There was another one in 380 or 381, I think, that was like the second Council of Ni Nicaea. But many people call these councils, this is where they, of course, in 325, the first council, they created the Roman Catholic Church. They invited all these um, bishops from all the different churches everywhere. Constantine and the Roman government actually funded um, the council itself. Um, so it was literally, it was literally a government-sponsored, you know, ecumenical conference is what it was. And uh, so this ecumenical conference, many people call it the first ecumenical conference and the second ecumenical conference. It was the beginning of ecumenicalism, which we'll talk about uh, this morning. But anyway, out of that came this Nicene Creed. All right, this, all right, let's all get together and come up with what we believe together, okay? And out of that, um, of course, is where we get this idea of the universal church 
itself. Okay, now remember this about yourself because many people do not know this about Bible believing Baptists, but here's the thing, folks not everybody showed up to that ecumenical conference. And one thing you have to remember about yourself, and people don't realize this, and you'll know this um, going out soul winning if it ever comes up in conversation or you know, deeper conversations about things, we are not a Protestant church. So we are not Protestants. Many people will think, oh, Baptists were you know, formed in you know, the, the 17th century when all the other Protestants you know, came out with Martin Luther and John Calvin, all these people. Um, we, or, you know, John Wesley, Joseph, yeah, the Wesley, you know, the Wesley doctrine, the Methodists and all this. We are not Protestants. We're not, pro, you know, Protestants mean people that came out of the Catholic Church were protesting the Catholic Church. We were never part of it. You know, they may not have been called, you know, they may, right after 325 A.D. is where the word Anabaptist started coming up right after that. And they weren't called Baptists before that because... They call them Anabaptists because they wouldn't accept the change to the gospel, meaning works-based salvation in all these sacraments. Okay, so basically, there's always been true believers since Christ and the book of Acts. All right, we are not Protestants. And when the Catholic Church was formed under the Roman government, kind of mixing this doctrine with all these different people and Roman paganism, um, we get the Nicene Creed, which brought in this doctrine that we're going to talk about, all that to say this, brought in this doctrine of the universal or Catholic church, you know, the universal church, meaning anybody that, you know, claims Christ is part of the church everywhere in the world. We're all part of the church right now. All right. So look, I talked, I'm going to talk to you about, you know, the wickedness of this doctrine and why it's such a big deal. I already kind of mentioned one um, aspect of it on Wednesday night is it takes away focus on the local assembly. A church is literally, if you translate it from the Greek, it is literally a local assembly of believers. All right, so it takes away, you know, the focus of what the Bible actually says of coming to an individual church in a location. All right, you can just say, if you believe in the universal church, you can just say, look, I've heard many people say this to me. Like, we're all part of the church. They don't go to a church, but we're all part of the church because they believe this universal church doctrine that is not in in the bible so no god wants you in a church we talked about that on wednesday night hebrews 10 25 and other places in the bible the internet is not a church you know which is a lot of you know it's a big problem today you know when everybody just stopped going to church and started just watching church online you know in a team's meeting or whatever you know that's not church you know the bible says that church is a local group, a local assembly of believers, all right? So let's look at this idea of the universal church. First of all, let's just do a, a quick Bible study on the word church in the Bible, all right? In the New Testament, the word church is used nearly 80 times, I think 78 or 79 times in the New Testament. Now, it is, it is used, majority of the time, it's used in Paul's nine epistles to specific churches, Okay, Paul has nine epistles. Then there's what's called the general epistles, which are two groups of people, you know, the Hebrews, you know, um, all these different um, books. But even, even in these other books where the word church is used, it's always used in the same way to mean a local group of believers in a local uh, place. Let's look at just a couple uh, of, uh, of verses. I'll read for you some verses. And then we'll turn um, to some verses as well. So why don't you turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 13. Well, I read for you Romans chapter 16 and verse number 1. Um, Paul says, you're going to go to 1 Peter 5. I'm going to read for you Romans 16 verse number 1 where the Bible says, I commend unto you Phoebe our sister, which is a servant of the church at Centria. So it's talking about, you know, you'll see this in the Bible again and again and again. And literally, I started to, as soon as I started reading the Bible, it's hard to not notice this. Because you notice that whenever it says the church, it's pointing, you know, 90% of the time it's pointing to a, a specific, it literally says the place right after that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's obviously talking to the church at Corinth. He mentions that in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians, um, just the beginning chapter. But he's saying when you come together in the church, he's talking about, you know, coming together in that local place. Look at 1 Peter 5, 13. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 13, the church that is 
at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Turn to Acts chapter 12. Turn to Acts chapter 12, and I will read for you 3 John um, chapter 1, verse number 9. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. So a letter was written unto the church. Now, people don't necessarily know like, where this Diotrephes was at. He's writing to a man called Gaius here, who many people think was, some people think he was part of the Corinth church, some people think he was part of the church in Ephesus. It doesn't really matter. Diotrephes was obviously a person that was obviously not like, you know, all present everywhere in the world. He was at some local assembly somewhere. That's what the church means there. Look at Acts chapter 12 and verse number 1. Acts chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. What church are we talking about here? Here we're talking about, you know, the church at Jerusalem here. We're talking about, you know, a specific local church church here. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse number 22, just a few, um, just a few um, chapters over in your Bible. Acts chapter 18, look at verse number 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, where? At Caesarea, he went down to Antioch. So it's very specifically pointing out these churches. It's pointing out these churches at different locations. Now here's some, let me just give you some controversial verses that, you know, people use to try to prove the universal church. Okay, turn to Acts chapter 9. Turn to Acts chapter 9. So you're saying, where are these people getting this doctrine? They must be using some verses. Obviously, we can look at every single verse where a church, the word church is used in the Bible, and see that it's, it's talking about a local assembly of believers. But look at Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The universal church people will actually say, and this is kind of a big red flag right here, look at Acts 9, 31. The Bible says, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. So here we're talking about, now if it was a universal church, we could just use the word church there. Then had the church rest throughout all these different regions. Instead, it specifically points out that the churches had rest. It's talking about regions. It's just talking about regions here. It's not talking about individual, you know, it's not pointing out individual cities, individual churches. And look, there's, I'm sure there's, there's many cities where there was many different churches in each city. But the point is, is that saying, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and area, Galilee and area, and Samaria and area. All right, so we're talking about all these different churches. He could have just said the church. Well, the universal church people that are really just like really on this doctrine, they'll say this is a mistake and it's a translation error in the King James Bible. All right, so they don't even believe the Bible, you know, shocker. So right away, that's a huge red flag. When you meet somebody that says, oh, that's a translation error, and they, they're, they're casting doubt on the Word of God, right away we can exit the building at that point, all right? So they say it should be just church uh, because, you know, that, that doesn't follow up their doctrine. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look at verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 28. The Bible says here, here's another verse that they'll use. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So here the Bible is saying here, when you actually let me turn there myself, because I believe um, just a couple verses before, and I'm going to bring this up on something else. But if you look at just a couple of verses um, before that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 28. Um, look at verse 27. It says, now ye are the body of Christ. Okay, so they'll basically say because 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 28 doesn't specifically talk to, you know, doesn't say the church at Corinth. I mean, first of all, the letter is to the church at Corinth. You know, obviously all scripture is profitable for doctrine for all of us, but he's literally writing um, about, you know, a generality about what God has done in the church. Talking about how he's put in local churches apostles. He's put in local churches prophets, teachers, and, you know, gifts of healings, and all these things. But up in the very first, in the very next, the verse above it, he talks about, you know, the church, you know, ye are, he's saying ye are. So it's like me, I'm talking to a plural group of what? Group of people, right? Ye are the what? The body of Christ. So he's talking about 
a church being the body of Christ. So ye are the body of Christ. So another word really for the, the word of a local church could be the body of Christ. But now how many people think now the body has many members? Now how many people think that like a body could have like an arm in Fresno and then, you know, a head in Africa or something? You know, so I mean, let's say, I mean, let's say I had a friend who was a, a Christian in Africa. All right. The proper way to say that biblically would be to, yeah, I'm a member of this body of Christ, and he's a member of that body of Christ. Churches, local assemblies. Not we're all the members of this, you know, um, body of Christ. All right, which, you know, is, a, is another way of pushing universal um, church doctrine, which somebody that might surprise you believed in. And I'll, I'll mention that um, in a little bit. But go, go to... Um, Colossians chapter 1, 18. We're looking at verses that people use to teach the universal church, all right? Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 18, which is an epistle, a letter to the church at Colossae, all right? And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Here, Colossians chapter 1, 18, and go to Ephesians chapter 1 now, he's just talking about the structure, what a structure of a church should look like. So the Bible here is talking in Colossians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1. It's giving us this doctrine of what the structure of a local church should be. All right? Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, just describing Christ here, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now, does that say that, like, there's a universal church? It simply says that this is the structure of the local church, that Christ is to be the head of the local church. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I'll just read for you. For I am the least of the apostles. And actually, why don't you turn there? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. Paul is saying, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle. He's saying, I don't even deserve this job that I have right now because I persecuted the what? He's saying, I persecuted the church of God. All right, Paul says, I persecuted the church of God. Now look at verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So, he, oh, he persecuted the church of God. There's the universal church right there. He's saying the church of God. I don't know. That sounds like kind of a universal name for all believers. All right? But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2. Look what he says. He says, unto, who's he writing the letter to? The Corinthian church. He's literally about to, I mean, look, and you, I mean, he's literally about to, we can learn lots of doctrine from Paul's letters to the Corinthians, but Paul's kind of ripping some face on the Corinthian church here. They've done some specific things. They've done, this is where we get a lot of our doctrine on things that, you know, how we're to react to certain things in the church, how, you know, a church is supposed to be managed. It comes from these two letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church because he's, he's using them as an example to say, look, you can't have these things happening there. But look what he says in verse 2. He says, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. All right, so obviously the church of God is again talking about the local church. Okay, so look, and also, you know, that Paul says that he persecuted the church of God. What was Paul doing? Paul was literally going around to different locations, attacking and persecuting what? Groups of people. He literally said, you know, in, in, the, in, in Acts, before he gets saved, he was literally on his way to Damascus to persecute the local people there. Like people in just a, a local area. All right? Because look, he traveled around and persecuted local groups of believers. That's what Paul was doing before he got saved. So look, we just need to use clear scripture to define doctrine. We can't just pull out like half of a verse and say, oh, that's a universal church, okay? So you say, all right, you say, I believe you, pastor, but what's the big deal? What's the big deal if somebody thinks that, you know, if somebody's saved and they think that, hey, I'm part of some universal, invisible church, okay? Well, first of all, you know, we know from Wednesday night that it diminishes the command to go to church. 
the command to be part of a local assembly. But there's much more to it than this. Turn to 2 John chapter 1. Turn to 2 John chapter 1. The term, look, if, if, the, if basically what this means is the word church has lost all meaning today, is what the universal church does, all right? I mean, if the term going to church isn't even true for most people, but they think they're still part of a church, a, you know, even if no one's even saved, you know, I mean, is it even a church? I mean, you have to ask yourself, um, what, what makes a church? What, what makes a church? Just because a bunch of people claim the name of Christ and get together, um, does that make it a church? What is it according to Jesus? All right. So the first thing I want to point out, the first major issue, aside from just diminishing the local assembly and the meaning of going to church and being part of a local assembly, is this. It diminishes doctrine. It diminishes the importance of doctrine in the Bible. Are you in 2 John chapter 1? Look at verse number 9. 2 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. The Bible says, Whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So it sounds to me like doctrine is pretty important. It sounds to me like doctrine is pretty important. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 33, and I'll read for you. Actually, you go to John chapter 7. I'll read for you Matthew 22. Go to John chapter 7. Go to John chapter 7. Matthew 22, 33 says this. It says, this is how important, look, this is how important doctrine is. Doctrine is literally what got Jesus in trouble. Doctrine is literally why people got upset at Jesus. You're like, well, why, why does he just not have doctrine then? But the point is, the doctrine was the, the entire, the, the doctrine was the point. Look at uh, John chapter 7, Matthew 22, 33 says this. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished at his doctrine. This is why because what he was preaching, who he was saying he was, is why Jesus was killed. I mean, obviously we know that he was killed to die, um, to take the punishment for the sins of the world. But the people that didn't believe in him, they were mad and they were upset at his doctrine. Look at John 7, 16. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Jesus said that the doctrine that I'm preaching is the doctrine of God the Father. So that's how important doctrine is. So this idea that we are all part of the church, no matter what doctrine we have, is just false. It's just, it's just not true. People that, you know, just claim the name of Jesus, regardless of any doctrine that they believe, and they're part of the church, is just, it's a, it's a horribly wicked false doctrine. And you know what? It's a false doctrine that does a disservice to those people that think that they're just part of this church, that they're, you know, they're in the club, when they're not even saved because they have the, the wrong doctrine. All right, look, the truth is, folks, is that most, most local church, it's much worse than this, because the truth is that most local churches today that we would look at and we would drive by on, on the, the highway or we would drive by down Bullard Street or whatever street and we would say, oh, there's a church. The truth is, is that those aren't even churches. If we want to actually look at doctrine in the Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. If we want to look at doctrine in the Bible, most churches aren't even churches. Most churches aren't even churches because of doctrine. All right, let's look at just this doctrine of the candlestick in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. So we see Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus is writing these letters or Jesus is talking to seven churches. We've studied this extensively, but what is he talking to them about? First of all, look at verse number five. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So Jesus is saying, go back to um, Revelation 1.20, the verse just before um, chapter number 2, Revelation 1, 20. Jesus is saying, like, look, if you, if you don't, this church, it's not that this church had a false gospel. It's not that this church, you know, was even preaching false gospel, false doctrine. It's just they weren't doing the work. They weren't doing the first works that Jesus told them to do. They weren't preaching the gospel. They weren't preaching the word of God. 
And Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to remove the candlestick from you. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, I'm going to remove the candlestick from your church if you don't fix these things. Look at verse number 20 of Revelation 1. It says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Now he tells us what they are. It's like the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. I believe this means the messengers of the seven churches or the pastors of that se those seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So when Jesus says, hey, get your works right, get your works right, or I'm going to remove your candlestick, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm going to remove you from being a church, is what he's saying. He's saying, literally, if you don't get your works correct, doesn't mention anything about doctrine. He's like, I'm going to remove you from being a church. So how do you think? And then he goes off, you know, on the other six churches and is like, there's some false doctrine by specific people in the churches. He's like, hey, you better not allow this in there. You know, and then some, you know, some, you know, some churches are just, they're not zealous. They're lukewarm. He's like, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Look, he's referencing just removing them as a church when he says things like that. Taking away that candlestick. Now, knowing that these are the standards... Think about that verse in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 5. That if a church, a local church, is not because it was a specific local church that he was talking to. Okay? Now, if a specific local church doesn't have the works, isn't doing the works that Jesus wants them to do, Jesus says, I will remove you from being a church. Now, what do you think Jesus would think with that standard in mind? What do you think Jesus would think about a church that's preaching a false gospel? And I say that word loosely. A a local group of people that are led by some person that's preaching a gospel that is different from the gospel that Jesus said. What do you think Jesus would say there? Well, the Bible tells us. Turn to Galatians 1. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. You say, you know, those seven churches, they were getting, you know, they were getting kind of raked over the coals by Jesus there for, you know, not doing the works and having some people in the church that were preaching some false things or saying some false things. You better get rid of those people, get that, those things right. Fornication, there were some sins that were being allowed that shouldn't be allowed. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 7, 8. Now, now look at what the Bible says about somebody that would come in and teach a local group of people a false gospel. The Bible says in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. We're talking about the gospel here. It says some people are coming in trying to pervert it. What does that mean? They're trying to twist it, change it, um, make it something bad. Okay, look at verse 8. Then Paul says, but though we or an angel from heaven, he's saying anybody comes and tells you some other gospel, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Verse 9, as we said before, so I now, I mean, you think he thinks this is, this is important? He's literally saying the same thing twice. If any man preach any other gospel to you than ye have received, let him be accursed. What he's saying is, he's going to this church at Galatia that he has heard has a false gospel being preached there, and he's like, if anyone do this, they're damned. If anyone do this, they're damned. Now what do you think about a local group led by somebody doing this? You think that... God, Jesus, by any stretch of the imagination, believes that they are a church. Absolutely not. God was going to remove the candlestick from the church in Revelation chapter 2 for not working hard enough, for not doing the right works. He didn't say anything about their beliefs being wrong. So most local churches, it's much worse than just this universal church of unsaved people it's most local churches are not churches. They're not a church. But yet, those people believe they are part of some weird, universal, weird, individual church, or invisible church, because they go to a building once every two months that has a cross on it. They think they're part of this weird, universal church. So... First of all, it diminishes doctrine. The universal church diminishes. It tries to round corners on doctrine. It tries to erase doctrine. What do you think that they had to do when they got together at that Council of Nicaea and they all had their doctrines? Some people had to drop their doctrines. If they were all going to get together and agree on this creed that they all believed. All right? The second thing is exactly what I just said, is it promotes ecumenicalism. That's what it does. 
And that's really the goal, is to promote ecumenicalism, you know, amongst, quote unquote, Christianity. You know, I mean, you say, well, now turn back to Luke chapter 12. You say, well, you know, I mean, can't we all just get along? Isn't it a good thing to get along? I mean, this is what people will say to you, you know, as you believe the Bible. They will say, well, why, you know, why do you, you know, why judge? Why judge? You know, why, why are you so judgmental? You know, well, what does Jesus say? The point is, is that Jesus says it himself in Luke chapter 12. Look what he says in verse 51. I read it for you at the beginning of the sermon. Suppose ye that have come to bring, to give peace on earth. He's saying, yeah, am I here to just put my arms around everybody and bring everybody in? And no. He says, I tell you nay, but rather division. Then he goes into this long diatribe about, you know, I'm going to divide the closest groups of people. Why? Doctrine, that's why. Because he's saying, he's saying, I'm here to divide because doctrine is so important. Doctrine is literally what God is going to get Jesus hung on the cross. And doctrine is so important, he said, that it will divide the, the closest groups of people. And he uses the example of a family in one house. Son, father, mother, daughter, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Very close people. He's saying it is going to divide. Why? Because my people are not going to give up their doctrine, is what Jesus says. He's like, look, if you think, if you think that you know, all people in one house have to get together and just, okay, it's not a big deal, and okay, I'll believe what you believe, and, and let's come up with, a, with a, a family creed in our house, Jesus is saying, that's not, that's, that's not my doctrine. He's saying, doctrine will divide people. And he says, that's why I bring division, because he brings very specific doctrine. So a local church, a true candlestick will divide. That, that is, I mean, it's kind of the sign of a local church. It's kind of a, a sign of a true candlestick is that it holds to doctrine. And look, if there's nobody, if there's nobody saying that, you know, what we preach here when I preach the Bible, if there's nobody saying that that's divisive, then I, I think I've got a problem. I've got a problem because Jesus literally said, who is the word, that I came to bring division. So if Jesus brings division, and I'm just all about getting together with everybody, and all about getting together with, with just whoever claims the name of Jesus has a cross on their building or whatever, I've got a problem because Jesus said he divides. All right, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And ultimately, it, it brings in ecumenicalism, which the problem there is it promotes compromise. It promotes compromise. You say, what kind of compromise? How big of compromise does it promote? Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. This is a story of Elijah and, you know, the showdown with the prophets of Baal. And I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I want to read you something that he said at the very beginning of this confrontation. Look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and look at verse number 20. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse number 20. So Ahab and Elijah, they don't really like each other because Ahab's wicked and Elijah's the man of God. So Ahab, in verse 20, he sent unto the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. These are all the prophets of Baal, all these false prophets. And Elijah, he, so he gathered the people and the false prophets. All right, and look what Elijah says. Before he gets down into this big showdown with these prophets, he says, Elijah came unto all the people and he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? He's saying, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You know why they didn't say anything? Because the people were kind of like, well, they worship God too. We worship God. It's, we all worship God. That's exactly what was going on. Now, you will find that today. Now, I'm talking about the ultimate ecumenicalism is that all religions worship the same God. This is the ultimate ecumenicalism. You know, there are quote-unquote Christian leaders that believe this. There are Christian leaders that believe that Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and all those people, they'll go to heaven too. You say, well, what about, you know, John 14, 6, where Jesus says, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then nobody reads the next part. It says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, there's Christian leaders that say, yeah, but people that don't know who Jesus is, you know, that doesn't apply to them. You say, what kind of Christian leader um, would say something like this? I don't know. How about this one? Billy Graham. 
Billy Graham, and you're like, oh, Billy Graham. Billy Graham believes that Hindus, Muslims believed that Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, he believed in this, this body of Christ. His, his word for the universal church was the body of Christ, which I already showed you that's not what it means. He believed that the body of Christ was the universal church on earth, and he, and he gave an interview in like 1997 saying, yeah, you know what? It's the body of Christ. Well, how do you get past, you know, the verses? Look at, look at, are you in Luke 12? Are you in Luke 12? Go back there. Look at, I believe, verse number 8. Verse number 8 of Luke 12. Look what Jesus says in verse number 8 of Luke number, chapter 12. He says, Also I say unto you, where, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. You know what a Buddhist will do if you walk up to his door and start talking to him about Jesus and he's not open to it? He'll deny Jesus. They, they don't believe Jesus was God. A Muslim will deny Jesus. A Hindu will deny Jesus. Look, I, I'm, that doesn't make me happy. I hope they would accept Jesus. We go and we try to get as many Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and, and all these different people saved as we possibly can. But you know what they'll do if they hold to their beliefs? They literally deny Jesus. But Billy Graham says in this interview, he says, Oh, you know, whether they consciously or unconsciously accept Jesus, they're, they're, they're going to go to heaven. I believe that they're all saved. Well, you're, like, you're just like, Pfft. like, who is this person? So not only did he preach, look, he just preached the false gospel anyway. He preached a repent of your sins, work-based, um, you know, gospel. He already preached the false gospel. So it really shouldn't surprise you that he doesn't believe the Bible, that he doesn't literally believe that he didn't believe the words of Jesus. Right? There's plenty of other wicked things we go into about that man. But the point is, like, this is where it goes, even with Christians. It's just, it's just like 1 Kings 18, where they're just like, oh, we all worship God. You're like, how could they possibly, you know, the children of Israel, except with everything that you know in the Bible, except prophets of Baal. It's the same thing today. We all worship the same God. We all worship the same God. Look. Elijah says, these things are not the same. You must choose one, is what he says. You must. You know what Elijah was teaching? You must divide, just like what Jesus was teaching. God wants you divided. So we see that, you know, people can go into this, like, ultimate ecumenicalism that anybody that claims God, look, this is what the Sikhs believe. The Sikhs will sit there, and they will listen to you preach Jesus, and they will say, I believe everything that you say. We all worship God. You know, Sheba and all these other gods and all these different things, they just add it all in. It's all God. It's not all God. Some are, is Baal, some is Satan, and only Jesus is God. You know, only Jesus is God. We were talking about that with Jehovah's Witnesses yesterday. You meet a Jehovah's Witness, you know, it's easy to say, like, who's your God? You go to a Jehovah's Witness, who's your God? Because they won't say Jesus. They don't believe Jesus is God. So look, it's, a, it's the dividing point, folks. You know, with people that, how about these people that think that, oh, anybody that claims the name of Jesus, I mean, just, now we just, we can take it down one level of hierarchy and be like, well, okay, you have to have Jesus, but anybody that claims the name of Jesus, th then they're in the, the universal church. Well, no, that's not what Jesus says in Matthew 7. We went into that in detail yesterday. Jesus literally said himself, those are red words in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. The words are red. He literally says, not everyone that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because they're, 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 they're Jesus plus works. That's why. So look, folks, this is important. This is important to remember that we are a local church because the universal church tries to round all these corners. It tries to break down all the division. It breaks down doctrine. It breaks down, look, it's telling a bunch of people that aren't saved that they're saved. It's making people believe that they're safe when they're not. It's making people believe in the prison cell of their life where they're waiting to go to hell that it's not a prison cell. It's dressing up the prison cell. It's making it look good so they'll stay in there. People need to know that these Divisions, these doctrines are important, and it's the difference between heaven and hell. But people just want to fit in, see? People just want to fit in. I even, you know, psychology today, I've got a little quote for you here. The need for acceptance. People just want to fit in. They want to be all together. The need for acceptance is a basic human instinct. 
Although some value it more than others, we all want to fit in, to belong, in order to achieve. That, in order to achieve that, we often present slightly different versions of who we are, depending on the environment of whose company we're in. They're saying people just like change who they are depending on who they're around. We should never do this. We might have new, newer editions of ourselves for work or at home or even online. Isn't that the truth? Then it talks about things like peer pressure. Peer pressure works. The reason that peer pressure works with kids and even adults is because of this. Is because this basic human instinct that people want to fit in. People want to, they don't want to go into a group of people and, and be the weird one. Or be, you know, you know, this is the peer pressure. Don't you want to be cool? Hey, you know, do it. You know, this is how bullies, you know, operate. You know, this is where, you know, and then also this is where this modern philosophy of, of you know, so people try to change for the group that they're in. This is where this mos modern philosophy of just be yourself. Hey, you do you. You know, how many times have you, you know, went out soul winning a couple years ago in Fresno and there's a couple guys there out in their yard, you know, smoking marijuana and like, how do you get to heaven? And they, they, they bought into this philosophy of you do you so much, they're just like, they're just like, be true to yourself, man. Just be true to yourself. That's where this comes from. Because they're just saying, hey, just be true to who I want to be. Look, that's a wicked philosophy too. But it's all based on this idea that we all want to fit in. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We all want to fit in. But the Bible says, and that's why Jesus is saying this over and over and over again about division. He's just telling us, like, this is how it has to be for you. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, the Bible says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Jesus is, or the Bible's telling us here that you're going to stand out if you do it right. You know, you're going to be peculiar. You can't be a Christian listening to what God's Word says and just want to fit in with everybody. You've got to let that go. You've got to let that go. And this is where, like, it really comes full circle right here in the sermon. So we see that Jesus divides. We see that Jesus divides, which is against kind of our, our flesh nature that wants to fit in. Jesus is saying, I divide, you know, and I, you know, I divide, which is against what your flesh wants to do, which is just fit in and not have any trouble with anybody. All right? That's where this idea of the universal church is just feeding the flesh. It's just feeding the flesh, and we all just want to get along. We all just want to fit in, all right? We all just want to fit in together. But guess what? As we become peculiar, you know, maybe there's peer pressure. We're just like, you know what? I don't care what all those other people say. But that's why we talked about in Hebrews 10.25, that's why when we talked about that Wednesday about that admonishment and that exhortation, you know what that is? That's positive peer pressure. <laughs> that's, that's basically what the world would call peer pressure, except in a good way. So the local church is so important because as we're peculiar, like, I don't have to be peculiar by myself. I'm not like some lone weirdo standing out here. I'm peculiar with a local group of people. And that's why, you know, it just, the local church makes so much sense. Everything in the Bible, you know, Jesus, I'm going to divide all these things. But if you think it through and look at how the church is structured and how everything is supposed to go in the church, as we talked about on Wednesday night, it all makes sense, and it makes sense for us. God's not just saying, hey, you know, dance this jig because I say so. He's saying, no, do it this way because it will help you walk this Christian life together. It's very hard being a, look, we've done it. It's very hard being a peculiar person, being a Christian on your own. That is a very difficult thing to do. And, you know, many people, including us at certain points before we came to California, failed in that area because we were just, we didn't have that positive admonishment. We didn't have that positive exhortation we didn't have that positive peer pressure is what it comes down to so look god designed it this way for us he designed it this way so a group of people could be successful in what in the first works that's the whole point all right so look the main thing is is that outside of us this universal church you say okay i just run into all these people that believe in the universal church it's going, to it's going to cost a lot of people their eternity is, is really my main concern, is that these people that believe this, it's giving them comfort where there shouldn't be any. Because guess what? The wrath of God abideth on them. Look, if the wrath of God abideth on me, I would want to know. I would want to know. And this doctrine 
it rounds, it, 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 this false doctrine rounds corners, it takes away that fear, it takes away, you know, the wrath of God upon people, that feeling that they should have that, hey, maybe I should go seek the truth and find out what's actually true. All right, so yes, it's very, very wicked. It's very, very bad. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll end here. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we will end there. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse number 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 3. The Bible says, If any man teach otherwise, again, talking about doctrine, and consent not to wholesome words, even to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the, again, the doctrine, which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men and corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Again, dividing, dividing us. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.